Now, all technology is rooted in ideology. Techn one of the, the big misunderstandings of the internet is it suddenly came along, this miracle, this religious miracle that was granted to us because we were such good human beings. Or, you know, maybe we behaved ourselves one day, so we got it as a Christmas present. It's absolute nonsense. The internet has a cultural and a very concrete cultural ideological context. It represents the, the fusion of the old military industrial complex of Southern California and the hippie ethic of Northern California. Both were, in a sense, opposed to authority. And in a book uh, written by Fred Turner, a Stanford University professor, an excellent book uh, entitled From Counterculture to Cyber Cyberspace, he explains that very strange union. Although on reflection, it's not that strange because both uh, the military industrial complex, which invented the internet, or at least financed the internet in the late 50s, and the counterculture of the late 60s in San, in San Francisco were libertarian, were hostile to authority, hostile to the state, hostile to traditions. So on reflection, I'm not sure how unnatural the union was, but it, these people were tied together by their libertarianism, by their hostility towards traditional forms of authority. How, how did their libertarianism tie together? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, I think there was a, you see it in the internet, is there's this hostility. The internet itself reflects a hostility towards authority. So the internet is an edge technology. It has no center. It's no coincidence, then, that it reflects the ideology of the people who invented it, the people who drove it. Um, I mean, technology is simply a reflection of human will. Technology isn't accidental. Technology just doesn't come about in a vacuum. You, talk, you said that both the military-industrial complex and, sort of, I guess, hippie counterculture, Northern California, San Francisco, were, were libertarian. How, how, does, how does the military... Well, complex I think the military-industrial complex was obsessed with the Cold War, obsessed with a hostility towards uh, Eastern Europe and towards state socialism. It's no coincidence that Reagan came out of that. It's no coincidence that the hippies themselves were really libertarian, were embracing the free market. It's no coincidence that most of the major intellectual figures of the contemporary internet are also free market idealists or radicals, people like Chris Anderson. So there is a, an, an ideological symmetry to what's happening. I'm not suggesting there's a conspiracy. I'm not suggesting that a, you know, a couple of people from Rand and Lockheed and some long-haired fatsos from San Francisco got together in the early 60s and said, how are, we gonna, how are we going to impose our way on the world? Things in historical terms don't work that simply. But I think it's very important for people to understand that the internet, with its absence of a center, with its obsession with the edge, is not coincidental. It reflects values. And technology can never be detached from values. Technology reflects human beings. Human beings don't reflect technology. Well, what do you mean by its obsession with the edge? Well, the idea that there is no center. I mean, when you listen to people like Berners-Lee and all the rest of the crowd, they idealize this notion for the first time in human history, we've created something without a center. It can't be controlled. Well, the reason we created it is because these people were opposed to the notion of hierarchy and authority. So it wasn't an accident they created their ideological wet dream. But you've also said that hierarchy and oligarchy is... Yes, I just lost it to okay. my sister. Yeah, great, thanks. It's great. <laughs> How does this fit then, that if they're obsessed with the edge, the kind of way of evangelizers are obsessed with the edge and having no center because they're anti-hierarchical, but you've also talked about the web being marked by hierarchy and oligarchy. How, how does that fit? Well, that's a really good question. And it can be summarized again in the nature of the companies. There's reality and there's ideology. So when you listen to the, the young men who run Google, they will spout the ideology about the absence of an edge. They will talk about doing no evil. They will, they will attempt to reform the world in their image. Their reality, though, is they're monopolizing the print business. They're putting newspapers out of business. 
The reality is they hire 747 jets. Uh, they buy the airports next to their office and they fly around Africa. So the reality of economics and the ideology uh, seem in contradiction, but when you understand, I think, the full history of the internet, it actually makes sense. Now, again, I'm not saying necessarily that they are hypocrites. I'm simply saying that there are these parallel worlds of the internet and the way people think. I'm not suggesting that they're consciously hypocrites or consciously opportunists, but what you have with the internet is a world on the one hand where a lot of young men, and they tend to be young men, uh, spout a lot of nonsense in my view about democratization and egalitarianism and the opening up of everything. On the other hand, these young men are becoming infinitely rich and powerful. I think what's really interesting uh, in, in terms of the way in which the counterculture has become the culture, particularly the Madison Avenue uh, media culture, uh, the work of cultural critics like Thomas Frank have shown that the counterculture has become the thing in itself, the thing of value. Adverts uh, leverage the idea of rebellion, of resistance to authority as a way of selling products. So the counterculture has become the heart of capitalism. And uh, so it's no coincidence that the new barons of capitalism, the young men in Google and, and Yahoo and MySpace and Twitter and Facebook, are also deeply countercultural. So in that way, is the web, rather than being, as some people said, you know, a leveling, equalizing force, actually good for the next stage of capitalism? The web as the next stage of capitalism, you're beginning to sound like me now. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the web is the digital version of capitalism, and social media is the next stage in post-industrial capitalism. And why is it the next stage? Well, it's the, the digital version. It's the way in which industrial production and industrial society is being replaced by the digital, by globalization, by the virtualization of production, by the, all the other features and values and ways of organizing that the web is. So I, I think that that's what's most interesting about the internet as the next stage in capitalism, as a very pure stage, uh, 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 a reflection of a, a very pure market capitalism, free market capitalism, hostility towards authority, hostility towards the state, hostility towards external laws and organizations. So what would you say to all those people, those kind of kids sitting there in front of their laptops, their computers with these kind of dreams of that somehow they're taking part in this great equalizing experiment that everyone's being connected around the world, it's this great new web family that's being created. What would you say to them? What would I say to the people who are sitting in front of their computers believing in revolution? I think I would say the same thing as the, the, those people in the 16th and 17th and 18th century who went to church and who believed in universal redemption or realization in heaven. I would believe that, that they are subjects or victims of, a, of, of, of false consciousness, that they're wrong, that they're believing in something that doesn't really exist, and they're dupes or they're exploited, particularly those of them who stupidly give away their labor for free so that young men in Silicon Valley can become infinitely rich. 